Good morning. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ who struggles with control and lust and greed and gluttony, and my name is Mark. It's good to see you this morning. If you're joining us for the first time in the last few weeks, maybe you haven't been here before and heard an introduction like that, if that sounds odd to you, we borrow that style of introduction from our Celebrate Recovery ministry because we know that Christ-centered recovery, uh, it understands that our identity is not in our sin struggle. Now, we have to actually acknowledge our sin enough to name it, but our identity is in the saving king who can move us forward. And that's what we've been hopefully heading through through the last three weeks. In fact, you can summarize this little series in three words. Week one, we talked about surrender. We present the real us before the real God and we give him our lives. Week two, Hunter and Alex took us through accept. You could also use another A word, admit. Where we acknowledge the broken, admit. Where we acknowledge the brokenness and the sin that we've done. We come clean with that. And then this week, we will talk about repair. And these are the principles for Christian growth in general. In fact, they are for anyone who needs healing and wholeness in Christ. And that, by the way, would be all of us in this room, me at the front of the line. We need to experience the saving God. Today's message, well, it'll continue to work through the same cycle. We understand that life has events that that deal with real hurts to us. Even those of us who are most privileged, uh, most blessed on the planet, we will not leave this planet without being wounded or without wounding others. Some of it is self-inflicted wounds. Some of them are wounds that we've suffered at the hands or words of others. But those hurts lead to unhealthy hangups, a false belief system, maybe a false identity. You embed those lies enough inside of you that that becomes your truth, well, then you will start to create some habits, some coping skills that need to be broken. And so today, we'll focus this message on the repair part of recovery. And in order for repair to actually start in our lives, we must acknowledge what happens inside of us when the hurts of life happen to us. And that's where we need to have an honest discussion about anger. Anger. Anger itself is not a sin. How do we know that? Because God feels anger, and he has and cannot sin. In fact, he tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, that'll be the passage we'll anchor in this morning, is the the back uh, third, or excuse me, the back quarter of Ephesians 4. He tells us in 4, 26 and 27, Be angry. By the way, that's a command. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. In other words, you hold on to that anger for too long. You're human. It'll turn sour, and what turns sour will turn bitter, and what turns bitter, it will create a habit in you, well, that'll just invite the enemy to keep weaving his lies into your life. But you got to notice that the beginning at the outset here, he does command us to be angry and just not sin in our anger. Dan Allender is a Christian counselor. He's a theologian. He's a seminary professor, written a a bunch of books, uh, particularly on the issues of the soul. I remember about 20 some odd years ago being in a meeting where Dan made this offhanded comment that I've never forgotten. He said, uh, the issue is not that Christians get angry. The issue is that Christians don't get angry enough at the right things. And I immediately saw myself in that quote. I saw the fact that I can get more angry about my fast food order not being filled correctly than I can that 20 million people are still trapped in human trafficking around the world. (laughs) Something's wrong with that. No, the issue behind anger is we've got to see what is behind our anger and then what we do with our anger because we all get angry. We just get angry in different styles. Some of us in the room are really good at stuffing and hiding our anger. You might learn to leave the room creatively, do the silent treatment. You pretend that the emotion is not there. 
Others don't do the whole avoid anger. You do the attack in anger. You come out in intensity and you make sure that it's known. Have you ever noticed that avoiders and attackers will find each other and decide to marry and do the rest of their lives together? What is that about? Lisa came from a long line of avoiders. I came from a a whole family system that didn't avoid anything. We marry at 22 years old and rent our 500 square foot studio apartment. She's trying to run in her anger and avoid conflict. I'm trying to attack in my anger and pursue conflict. But not many places to go in 500 square feet. By the way, in Arkansas, that kind of behavior, that's called hunting. That is not called repair. We've got to find a different way to do anger. And the first thing we need to realize is that anger is a secondary emotion. Anger is the thing that we feel secondarily after a primary emotion is felt, usually one of three, hurt, fear, or frustration. How else do you explain that you hit your thumb with a hammer and immediately you get angry? That hurt produced a secondary emotion of anger. How else do you explain a mother who's lost her toddler in a Walmart? She's panicked. She finally sees that son. She hugs him toast, and then she shakes him and shouts at him. That fear caused a secondary display of anger. What we need to do is understand why that anger is there. See, anger is like the red light on the dashboard of your car. You do not take it, hopefully, you do not take it to your mechanic and say, please, repair the light. You know that he needs to pop the hood and find out what's going on underneath. We need to know why anger is there. Now, how do we know that that's a good strategy for dealing with our own anger? Because it's the one that God uses. And I think anytime God moves, we take a play from his playbook. By the way, that's what you call godliness, is copying him. And God said to the very first angry human being who ever walked the planet in Genesis chapter 4, his name was Cain. He was enraged with jealousy over his brother Abel. And God did not show up in Cain's life and say, boy, knock that off. He said, Cain, why are you angry? Now listen, if the heavenly father deals with his kids' hearts that way, don't you think it would be wise for us to take the same play? Mark, why are you angry in this situation? Because if you can step back and understand the why, what's underneath that, well, then you might see that anger is is really a messenger trying to deliver another message to your life. If we don't understand the why, we're going to be driven to the hangups and then maybe even enslaved to the habits that trap us. And I don't think I understood this about anger until I walked through an extended season where the blows of life just kept hitting. We walked, Lisa and I walked through a seven-year season of pain that started in 1998 and began to wrap up around the 2005. Not that life has not had its losses and pains after 2005. That would be denial. But in this season, it was extremely intense. 1998 started with a small bout of cancer in me. 2004 and 2005, that bout of cancer reoccurred, and it was not small. It took 153 treatments and uh, some surgeries and a a little over a year to work on that. Now, the reason I share the cancer as the part of the story is the most painful part of that seven years was not the cancer. That was the least painful part of life. They were the small bookends. Inside was the real pain of five years in between. On July 22nd, 1999, our middle school daughter was the victim of a violent crime. Our family found our story on the front page of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Because there are little ears in the room, I won't go into great detail, but I'll say it this way. The crime was vile and violent enough that the perpetrator was sent away to prison for life without the possibility of parole. And the wound inside of us is larger and deeper than I even had 
and even today still have words to express. I'm not denial and understood the confusion and the anger. I understood the grief, but it was far deeper than I knew. My first concern would be the same as yours. It was her healing and her recovery physically, emotionally, and spiritually. But right behind them were the other people in our home that were, were so hurting. My wife, my other three children. And honestly, they took all of my energy and attention. And I didn't really tend much to my own heart. Now listen, I wasn't in denial. I did understand that I was grieving. I did understand that I was angry. And I understood that I was confused. But I did what I know how to do. Listen, I grew up in a military family. I know how to soldier on. I grew up as an athlete. I know how to play hurt. My biggest concern was do the next right thing for the people who are most important to me, which was our large family and a growing church that was confused and didn't know how to process it either. So I walled off the anger and I continued on in my walk with God the best I knew how. The trial for that crime came a little over a year later, so that in their first year process, life beyond the 50 hours of work during the week was was filled with helping our daughter work through uh, trial preparation as well, navigating a criminal justice system, uh, and continuing to shepherd a family and and a church. About a year after the trial finished, in 2001, I was worn out. Still functioning, at least I thought so. Still functioning, but so, so, so tired on the inside. And I began to notice some relational distance and tension started appearing with a coworker that I was very close to. In fact, I would have said he was my closest friend. I'd had the privilege of helping to restore him uh, after a fall and... um, uh, a moral failure in his previous life. He had had the privilege of helping me walk through the pain of my daughter's attack. In many ways, he was closer than a brother. And yet over the next year and a half, he would do and say some very specific things that, well, they were just personal and professional betrayal. And it created an enormous amount of pain in my life personally, my wife's life but also created a ton of pain in the church that we were shepherding and trying to care for. And don't forget what I do for a living. Usually when you walk through the betrayal and the pain of life, your church is the place you lean to get through, get clarity, get comfort, get strength, and move forward. What do you do when you're on staff with the very church that has become such a source of pain? You can imagine If you're sane, anger is the result. And I didn't want to stay stuck in that anger. And I knew enough about God to know that he had a better way. But I also knew that that better way was going to lead to a harder path. A path that included this word, forgiveness. Folks, all repair, all recovery, ultimately takes us down the road of forgiveness. Again, staying at the end of Ephesians chapter four, we notice that Paul moves from talking about understanding and dealing with our anger to verse 31 saying, all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander must be removed from you with all, along with all malice. In other words, you're gonna have to deal with that anger. It can't stay there. It's gonna turn sinful. But don't just get rid of the anger. Then he wants us to move in a positive way. Be kind to one another, compassionate, Forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Forgiveness. How could God be asking me to forgive the stranger who hurt my child? How could he be asking me to forgive the friend who betrayed and created so much pain? And this passage was a piece of the healing balm and clarity. There were two little words that jumped out of this verse that really meant something to me. Look at the verse deeply. Pick two words for you. By the way, it's all God's word. Trust me, there's lots of two good words in there. 
For me, the two words were these two. Just as. He wasn't just calling me to forgive. He was calling me to forgive just as God in Christ has also forgiven me. And those two little words, they changed everything. I started to see if I could understand what God's forgiveness was like, then it would maybe help teach me what my forgiveness could be like. And maybe it could also even dispel some myths about forgiveness that keep us all so trapped. Myths like we tell ourselves, I should forgive, but I can't forget. Listen, at some level, true forgiveness requires remembering. And that's because to forgive means to let someone go of a debt. You cannot let go of a debt until you remember that they owe you something. And we do forgiveness just as God in Christ forgave us, and and God does not forget our sin. Now, hopefully by now, some of you are thinking, now, wait a minute, there is a verse, doesn't it, that say God remembers our sin no more? Yes, it's in Isaiah, but please do not interpret that to mean that the omniscient, all-knowing God somehow forgot that sin happened. When he says he remembers our sin no more, he means this. I remember your sin no more because I remember that it was paid for already. See, I know that God doesn't forget sin for all of eternity. I know that because he chose to let Jesus only take one man-made souvenir from this earth. His scars. Now his beauty marks. And those scars will forever remind us two truths. Truth one, sin has happened. Truth two, it has been paid for. All sin. I don't have to forget in order to forgive. Second myth, I should forgive, but it still hurts. And again, just as forgiveness. When did Jesus say, Father, forgive them? They know not what they do when he was on the cross at the height of his pain. So maybe we are never more like Jesus than when we forgive someone, even while we're hearing the sting of their words or we feel the sting of their actions or inaction. We can forgive even when it still hurts. In fact, just as forgiveness is not pretending that the wrong did not happen, that is denial. And Jesus did not pretend that our sin didn't exist. He did not deny our sin. He died for our sin. He did not dismiss it. There's a world of difference in there. Third myth, I should forgive, but I just can't trust them anymore. Or they're just gonna do it again. And I understand this one. I believe trust and forgiveness are linked, but they are not the same thing. We can forgive someone even when trust has not been rebuilt. In fact, if trust is going to be rebuilt, we must forgive them first because forgiveness paves the road that trust is gonna travel across. Think about it this way. Uh, Forgiveness, it's a one-way street. Trust is a two-way street, meaning this. Trust takes both parties in the relationship coming together to reconcile and trust to be established. The person who's done the wounding needs to seek forgiveness and own it. The person who's been wounded needs to grant forgiveness and then trust can be established. Two-way street. But what happens if this individual is just clueless, in denial, excuses it? We can still practice the one-way street of forgiveness. We may still have to keep a boundary up with that person. The trust may not have been established enough for you to allow them access into your life. But forgive, we must. Otherwise, we'll be in bondage to bitterness. You know, Colossians 3 is a mirror passage to Ephesians chapter 4, but it adds a little phrase. Colossians 3 says that we bear with one another, we forgive each other. Here's a little phrase. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, whoever, anyone. Whew, that's all encompassing. I'm a a forever, I'm a whoever, and you're an anyone. Sometimes you're a whoever and I'm an anyone. And we now find ourselves commissioned in the command to forgive just as the Lord forgave us, which means the little and the big, the nagging continual offense and the shattered betrayal. 
How can God ask us of this? And it's because he knows the truth about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not something we muster up. No, the truth about forgiveness is this. I can forgive because I am forgiven by Christ and I forgive through Christ. And both statements are huge. See, there's no other way to recovery into wholeness than through forgiveness. And yes, it is a hard road. It's even harder if the pain that you're having to forgive is a huge betrayal or a broken vow or a repeated offense. But there are no shortcuts to the freedom and life of Jesus. And it shouldn't surprise us because we call ourselves followers of Jesus. And Jesus is the one who walked a bloody Calvary road to forgiveness. Why as followers of him do we think that we will find life in a shortcut around that? No, he calls us the same way. It is costly. But men and women, Jesus will meet you on that road. He is not sending you on a forgiveness journey that he's not willing to A, walk, or B, walk with you. He gives the power to forgive. We forgive others in obedience to God, first and foremost. I, I, I don't think we can withhold forgiveness until we think that person deserves it or has apologized enough or has changed their behavior enough. No, we forgive that person because Jesus is worth it and he has forgiven me. In fact, I really believe that my forgiving others has more to do with me and Jesus than it does to do with me and them. This relationship is the most controlling relationship, influential relationship in my life, and therefore it empowers this relationship. In fact, when we forgive, all we're doing is extending what God has already given us. You think of the treasures, the trillions of tons of forgiveness that he's showered on us. When we forgive him, he's asking us to dip a cup into that and give an ounce away. He's not telling us to muster it up. He's telling us to stop hoarding it and to pass it on. That's what makes forgiveness possible and even reasonable, which means it moves me to this place of I choose to let go of their debt against me. See, forgiveness actually means that phrase, let go. Another word for forgiveness, so every time you read the New Testament, think of the word release. Uh, we are actually letting go of our right to have them pay us back for the debt that they owe. I think forgiveness is like a game of tug of war. As long as we keep pulling the rope, the war is on. The moment we let go, the war is over. And we can go back to life and to freedom. So letting go begins with a choice. You will not feel your way into this choice. If you're emotionally healthy, you will feel angry. You'll feel grief. You'll feel confusion. You'll feel tension. But you can still choose to let that person go from what they owe you or the way they've hurt you. And when we still choose, it puts us in a place where we can uh, begin to experience the freedom but that first beginning choice will have to continue to be followed up by the second, third, fourth, and infinity choice. Because the third myth, or the first, excuse me, the third truth, I can forgive because I continue this choice as often as I remember the hurt or the offense. You see, during the years right after my daughter's attack, followed up by my friend's betrayal, I remembered the pain of those sins daily. I mean, how could I not? Those sins brought real collateral damage, and much of my waking hours was spent working through and unpacking the collateral damage, only causing me to feel it day after day. Every time I dealt with the fallout, the anger and the hurt would rise up again. And I knew First John. I knew that the Apostle John coaches or pastors or shepherds or hearts by saying, listen, if you hate your brother, the love of the Father is not in you. Now, I knew enough about God to know that that didn't mean if you hate your brother, God stops loving you. Uh-uh. His love is unconditional. 
You just can't outrun it. What it meant is, if you've got hate in your heart towards your brother, you are blocking up and not experiencing the love of the Father moving through you. I knew that was true and did not want to stay there. In fact, to go further, I will tell you, I hated the fact that I hated my brother and would bring that constantly before him. And every time I did, I would say, I choose to let it go. I'm forgiven. He's forgiven. I let it go. Sometimes, no choice to let it go would happen 14 to 19 times a day. Possibly more, but I was sleeping the rest of the time. But then as I continued doing that, every time the hurt came up, I noticed that it only happened a few times a day. And then once a day. And then a couple times a week. Then once a week. And then a couple times a month. Then once a month. 20-something years later, only a couple of times a year. The freedom starts to happen as we walk the road. I ran across this quote last week. It's a little long, but I think it so articulately summarizes what I'm trying to say in words that are way, way better than my own. And so let's walk through it. The writer here says, forgiveness involves an intentional decision to let go of resentment and anger. The act that hurt or offended you might always be with you, but working on forgiveness can lessen that act's grip on you. It can help free you from the control of the person who harmed you. Sometimes forgiveness might even lead to feelings of understanding, empathy, and compassion for the one who hurt you. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting or excusing the harm done to you. It also doesn't necessarily mean making up with the person who caused the harm. Forgiveness brings a kind of peace that allows you to focus on yourself and helps you go on with life. Is that not good? You would think I got that from a Christian counseling book, or maybe better, from Sarah Schaefer in our counseling ministry, that she wrote that. Now, here's the source. The Mayo Clinic. Premier health clinic in our country. Dialing up truth about forgiveness because God's truth is always true regardless of where it's found. This is the process of forgiveness. I guess if I had to rewrite the cycle of hurts, habits, and hangups differently, I would say this is what the cycle of forgiveness would look like. First of all, you got to acknowledge the pain. Denial won't help. Once you acknowledge the pain, you move towards acknowledging the payment. Jesus paid for that sin and my sin. It is covered by his blood. And because it's paid for, we can choose to let that person go from their debt. And because we're human, we'll keep feeling it. So we'll keep choosing to let that person go as often as we remember. That's the process of walking the road of forgiveness. And ultimately, you know that it's forgiveness is taking root in your heart when it starts to show fruit in your life. And in the New Testament, we won't look at every passage this morning. Every time it talks about forgiving someone else, you'll always see the word kindness tied to it. First Peter chooses to use the word blessing. When you receive a curse from somebody, he says you return a blessing. The point is this, you know forgiveness is taking root here when kindness is starting to show up in that relationship. Now listen, kindness is more of an art than a science. For some people that you've had to create a boundary for, kindness might just mean you no longer speak ill of them. You no longer wish ill of them. For me, it became, I paused and I prayed for, that, for the goodness of God to be on that person's life. For you, it might be a kind word that you would say or a kind action. You will move up to that place of kindness, but that won't finish the journey because if you're sane and human, hopefully you're both, you'll remember it again. And when you remember it again, you go back to remembering the payment, choosing to let go, keep choosing, moving in kindness. You do that a few hundred times and you'll be walking free. It's the path of freedom. My daughter and I talked a lot about the freedom of forgiveness in the years soon after. Not right away, 
but soon after her, her, uh, her attack. I watched this middle school girl move into a ridiculously joy-filled teenager and young adult because she humbly and courageously began to walk the path of continual forgiveness for her attacker. I watched one time a kid in a youth group in a senior year of high school smart off to her and say, the reason you're so joyful is you've had such an easy life, just a pastor's kid and a perfect little life. She smiled and thanked them, turned the other cheek and said, I have been blessed, thank you. I watched the freedom and strength continue to grow into her adulthood. She and I talked a lot about if, the fact that if we chose not to forgive him, then he would not be the only one serving a life in prison sentence. We would be there with him too. The only difference is that we would haul our little jail sail around life with us and we'd be in bondage. And as the release happened, the joy and the peace began to radiate. I'll never forget Mother's Day, 2018. Lisa and I didn't worship with you all that day because our daughter and her husband, he pastors at another church, and she had been asked to teach alongside their pastor that morning about her road to forgiveness. And really, her whole message was on the faithfulness and the goodness of God to walk her every step of the way. And we sat in the back of a worship service, I was blown away at the peace and the joy that radiated, and I knew it was the real deal, that she wasn't just pulling off a Christian con job up front on a stage. And I cried. It was the best Mother's Day gift I've ever received. Because <sighs> I was watching freedom happen. And I said, God, you're so good. We could have gone to jail of bitterness ourselves. Thank you for being good to command us to the hard Calvary road of forgiveness. You really do love us. I remember she said in her message a line that I'll never forget. She said, I knew my Savior was calling me to forgive this man. And I also knew my Savior was worthy of my obedience. So I brought the two together. Our forgiveness has more to do with us and Jesus than even us and another person. And I don't know where you might be in that road, but my hunch is too much life happens to too many of us. There is a, someone that maybe has been coming to mind all morning where you need to seek their forgiveness. You've been the one who's wounded and you have not yet confessed. Or you need to be the one who grants forgiveness. Someone has hurt you. And even if they don't come and seek you out, you're being invited on the road of freedom of forgiveness. That's why we'll move towards a time of communion. A time of communion is celebrating the just as forgiveness that we have in Christ. And during this time of communion, some of us, some of us are thinking of someone who has wounded us and we've been holding on to that offense what I want to ask you to do is when the elements come, begin to process the letting that go, remembering that Jesus has paid for their sin and yours, and you're both under the same freeing, cleansing blood of Christ, and begin to release them or release them again. For some, you need to maybe seek forgiveness. There's someone you have wounded, and maybe for you, you need to let the communion elements pass you by without taking them. And you need to make a vow to God this morning that you won't partake in the Lord's Supper until you've gone to that person and confessed and humbled yourself before him. I would ask you to believe that your Savior is worth it and worthy of obedience and follow him. Let's quiet our hearts.